Five years ago, we started Axios with the mission to get you smarter, faster on topics that matter. We get you smarter about national topics like tech, politics, and sports. We make you smarter about your community with Axios Local. And now we want to get you smarter, faster about your job with Axios Pro. Finding the right news and information for your work can be daunting. And most of the time, when you do find what you need, the information is just too long and too boring. You should be using your time to make decisions, not sorting through noise. Axios Pro is here to help you make smarter decisions faster. Our deeply sourced reporters will give you actionable intelligence that's delivered in a way that's quick and easy to read. No fluff, just the good stuff. With Axios Pro, we're going to focus on the industries that matter to you. Each industry will have its own dedicated team of resources and reporters who know these industries inside and out. Every weekday will bring you important information and analysis that you can't get anywhere else. And guess what? This is just the beginning. Start your free trial at AxiosPro.com. Welcome to Axios News Shapers, Earth Day's call for climate action. I'm Mike Allen, a co-founder of Axios, coming to you from Axios HQ in Arlington, Virginia. We'd like to welcome our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. We'd love for you to join the conversation on Twitter at Axios, hashtag Axios Events. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague, Ben Geeman, for this Earth Day special. Our first guest is Gina McCarthy, White House National Climate Advisor. She's been head of the EPA. She's worked in both Republican and Democratic administrations. Gina McCarthy, welcome to Axios. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be with you again. So I put on a little green for Earth Day. How do you celebrate? Well, first of all, I celebrate by remembering all the good stuff that's happening. And there's lots of wonderful actions being taken by President Biden and others to make sure that we tackle the climate crisis. But Mike, do it in a way that's really just going to grow jobs, that's going to give families money in their pockets again. Look, there's all kinds of opportunities. So for me, every day is sort of Earth Day. So I celebrate as much as I can while recognizing there's a lot of work that we need to do together. But the U.S. is back in it and we're acting and and we're going to keep pushing as hard as we can to make sure that we tackle this climate crisis in the smartest way that we can. So that's the tweet, Gina McCarthy, every day is Earth Day. Now, Congress hasn't given you as much help on climate as you'd hoped, a little spoiler uh, there, and yet you've still been busy. Yeah, I mean, I think Congress did a good thing in the bipartisan infrastructure law that gave us a significant amount of resources so that we really could invest in a clean energy economy and create those jobs and, and focus on environmental justice communities, which, Mike, as you know, is a big commitment that the president has made with his Justice 40 commitment. So we do have resources and we are out expending those. And that's putting us really on an an irreversible path towards a clean energy economy. And what we need to make sure we do is accelerate that to the, to the extent that science is demanding it. Look, we don't have time to waste. So having those resources is great. We need, we need uh, Congress to actually take more action to make sure that climate solutions are affordable to everyone, to make sure that we're actually continuing the tax credits that help with clean energy manufacturing and deployment. 
Uh, but we're excited about what we've been able to do so far. But, you know, it's a daunting challenge. So we have to get up every day being positive about the solutions available now and investing our bipartisan infrastructure law on things like resilient infrastructure so that we can make sure that as we're rebuilding, we're doing it with climate in mind. And we're focusing on those lead pipes, getting them out of the system and building an EV charging system. So it's exciting exciting times, but it's also thought provoking about how we can keep moving this forward and keep producing the kind of jobs and benefits that people in this country really need right now. You said that Congress needs to do more. An election year, of course, is tough. How optimistic are you that you'll sneak in some climate legislation in the months to come? Yeah, I, I am pretty confident, actually. The bipartisan infrastructure law was heavily investing in climate solutions, and that made it through. And the president is really doubling down on his commitments now and his demand that, that Congress work with him because he's doing everything from like protecting and ensuring we can have critical minerals that are going to be so important to clean manufacturing and advancing energy security for our country. We've moved forward with the offshore wind industry, but all of this can, can actually be incredibly producing jobs, not just on our ports, but in the manufacturing sectors in our heartland. So we have to keep pushing forward. Look, the auto workers and automakers have gotten together with the administration and they're all supporting really strong efficiency standards for vehicles because electric vehicles are our future. Let's talk about giving people, consumers, the edge to make sure that they have the kind of rebates they need to, for everybody to afford these vehicles. So we can't stop now. We have to move forward. And it's exciting because we can, but it's also going to be a big challenge to have Congress continue to work together to make these kind of tax cuts and consumer benefits available to everyone. I hear from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue that there's optimism about getting Senator Joe Manchin, who, of course, is chairman of the Energy Committee, getting his help with some sort of a very limited climate energy package. It sounds like you share sometime this spring. It sounds like you share that optimism. Well, I do. I mean, I share the optimism that Senator Manchin helped to get over the bipartisan infrastructure law. I know he's interested in significant investments that will advance climate. And so I'm hoping that there will be a meeting of the minds. Um, but I think it goes beyond hope. I think we're, we're actually going to show him and others that these are necessary investments, not sacrifices, but the ways in which we're going to deliver for the American public. Look, we don't have time to spare. We don't have a lot more opportunities available to us than we have today to be able to get this job done. We are perfectly positioned to build on the work we've already done and make that path to a clean energy future that the president has been very clear needs to be now that we advance these efforts. And, and we're gonna do our best to work with Senator Manchin. There's things he wants, there's things we want. And that means we should be able to get an agreement and move forward in Congress. For Axios on HBO, you and I tooled around in an electric car, a Chevy Bolt. You literally picked me up on a corner. Uh, I trusted you as the driver. You trusted me as a passenger. <laughs> I've seen you in an electric King Cab. And the other day, I saw you with an electric bus. I did. Well, I, I've, uh, I guess I've grown up a little bit. You know, I think I was there with, uh, with Secretary Buttigieg from the Department of Transportation. And the reason I was there was to, to make sure to call attention to the fact that, that buses are getting to be zero emission as well. We're talking not just about school buses, which are so important to keeping our kids healthy, but also to transit vehicles, because that's going to help us lower overall carbon 
pollution for the planet and for its people, but also in local communities, especially environmental justice communities. There are so many people that rely on transit buses to get to and from work, to and from doctor's appointments, to and from our parks and our, our recreational facilities. We have to make sure that those are zero as well. And the bipartisan infrastructure law is making significant investments possible. So DOT is getting that money into the hands of states and local communities and school systems so that we can really make a broader difference than in single uh, occupancy vehicles, but moving to vehicles that are so essential for communities. I hear from inside the West Wing that you have a very good relationship with President Biden. He gets you or you get him or maybe both. What's something that isn't widely known about what or underappreciated about what makes him tick? Well, you know, I think the reason why I, I came on on board in the in President Biden's administration was because, you know, he is so people focused. You cannot give him, you know, a technology speech and say, isn't this cool? And think you're at the end of the discussion. He wants to know what's it cost? How many jobs are going to be tied to it? How are people going to save money? How do I articul articulate the benefits to families moving forward? If you can't meet those hurdles, don't give them the cool technology speech because it ain't flying. You know, he just knows who he works for. And every day he never stops thinking about how to make good on his promise to the American public, not just about climate change, but fundamental opportunities for them to thrive as individuals and families. And so that's what he's all about. He never forgets it. And frankly, neither do I. You know, I started out in this government work many decades ago. I started out as a local health agent. It made me realize just how important these are to people in their everyday ability to think positively, to look at government as working for them. And I think President Biden has restored that. And I applaud him for it. And I love being part of that team. Gina McCarthy, some personal news. You're not going to be part of the team for long. You're headed out. What is next? For Gina McCarthy? Well, Mike, I haven't actually announced anything because I still have some more work to do. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be here to the end of my days. Um, there, there, there. Uh, so, so th there is there is real work that has to be done. I'm not done yet. I'll let folks know certainly in advance of when I plan to leave. But right now, my only plan is to deliver for President Biden on on the climate actions that we need, and to show folks that those actions really are ones that don't require sacrifice, that ought to be embraced and applauded and move forward as quickly as possible. So I'm not ready yet to call it a day or ride off into the sunset, but you'll be one of the first to know when I am. And whatever your timetable is, if I know you well, you're not gonna ride off into the sunset, whatever's next. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I couldn't do it when I left EPA. Um, I'm not gonna do it now. Um, I, the job's not done. And so anything that I can do in my own personal capacity or uh, looking at other opportunities, I'm just going to take them because we haven't gotten this far and have this pinnacle of, of potential success ever before. And I want to make sure that I'm out touting these opportunities we have, making sure that people understand that we're working uh, continually to make sure that our kids have a safe and secure future. And I'm gonna keep reminding them that, you know, today it's been very clear that we have to wean off our fossil fuel dependency and allow our kids to have a clean energy future that they deserve. As we say goodbye, we always end with one fun thing. I'm gonna do a quick speed round, a double header here for the Fenway in you, your favorite exercise. And when I'm in Massachusetts, what's one thing I should do? Well, my exercise is to run around Jamaica Pond only very, very slowly. 
Um, I, I Jamaica Pond, I live on it. It's a beautiful small pond in, in the city of Boston. It's a great place to go. You meet people all the time. Everybody, every other person's wearing a Red Sox baseball cap, which makes me fascinated by it. And so I love doing that. And I think if you come to Boston, that's one thing you should try out. And I certainly wouldn't miss the outside dining on the North End because you actually have to combine the two. You eat lots of pasta, you come and walk around a little bit and you enjoy both the fresh air, the beautiful water and the great people of the city of Austin. I'm in. Gina McCarthy, thank you for joining Axios. Take care. Thanks, Mike. Happy, happy, Earth, Day. happy Earth Day. Jinx. And next we have a view from the top from Chris Freights. Thanks, Mike, and thank you to our sponsor, Bank of America, for making this conversation possible. And joining us now from Bank of America is Global Environmental Executive, Alex Liffman. Alex, happy Earth Day. Welcome to Axios. Thank you, to you as well. So Alex, Bank of America has set emission reduction targets to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. What are those targets? And how will they help you achieve that goal? Well, to start with just a little bit of background, a year ago, Bank of America made two big commitments, actually. One, we committed to achieving net zero, as you say, across the whole of our value chain, our operations, our supply chain, but also our financing activity before 2050. But our second goal in support of this first goal is committing to mobilize a trillion dollars in capital by 2030 to accelerate the transition. Now, if you think about that net zero before 2050 goal, that's 28 years in terms of length. So it's important to set shorter term targets. And we've done that with a range of 2030 targets. Prior to our most recent announcement, we had already set a whole suite of ambitious operational and supply chain goals. But as a financial institution, our greatest ability to help drive emission reductions at scale is frankly through our financing of clients. It's the capital, it's the advice, it's the other support that we provide our clients in their net zero journeys. So a big part of our focus of the, over the past few years has been on how we measure, disclose, and ultimately reduce emissions associated with our financing or our financed emissions of clients. And frankly, there hasn't been a guidebook for this. So we've engaged with, we've helped to launch a number of different industry collaborations focused on creating standards, guidelines, best practices on how banks and other financial institutions approach getting to net zero financed emissions. So in the interest of time, I won't attempt to enumerate all of that work, but we took the learnings from those groups. We combined it with what the science tells us we need to achieve by 2030. And we just set our first round of targets focused on reducing finance emissions in three key sectors, auto manufacturing, energy, and power generation. And our targets are focused on supporting our clients in reducing the emissions associated per physical unit of what those industries produce, kilometers driven, megajoules of energy, megawatt hours of power. And we see these targets as a key part of how we work with our clients. That's why we set the complementary goal to mobilize a trillion dollars in capital by 2030 to help fund the investments, the business realignment, all the change our clients need to make to achieve their own decarbonization and net zero plans. And you raise a great point there because you do need these shorter term goals to be able to reach the longer term goal. In fact, when you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report, it paints a pretty grim picture about the impacts of climate change and what we can do before those impacts become irreversible. Do you think your targets can be met quickly enough to stave off this impending environmental disaster? Yeah, I'm so, I'm so glad you raised the IPCC report. I mean, for those of us who have been following climate change, the conclusions from the report were certainly alarming, but, but not surprising. At Bank of America, we frankly have treated climate change as an urgent issue for years, really decades. Um, and we've also understand it, understood excuse me, that we need to accelerate the pace and scale of our emission reductions whether in our operations or, or how we're financing our clients, which is frankly why we've set these 2030 targets. 
both the portfolio targets, and I should mention that we will set others, and our trillion dollar target to mobilize capital. So to answer your question, they are ambitious, but they are also achievable. Um, but having said that, our success will require a number of things. It's going to require continued and robust engagement with our clients, which we're committed to. It's going to require a supportive policy environment. It's going to require collaboration across all sectors of the economy, along with those policymakers, regulators, nonprofits, other stakeholders, which is why if you look at our approach to zero, which we framed up in these five A's, um, you will see that we start with assisting our clients and advocating for industry standards, advocating for a supportive policy environment. I mean, we're realistic about where we are today. Certainly our clients are still learning about climate change. They're still learning about greenhouse gas emissions. They're learning about how to mitigate those emissions, which is why as their trusted partner, we're really here to work with them to help to finance the transition. Yeah, Alex, and I want to dive a little bit deeper into that work because, of course, as big as it is, Bank of America is just one company among thousands across the world. So tell me a little bit more. How are you helping your clients address climate change in their own businesses? Well, I would say we are just one company. Uh, I will say we're one very committed and focused company. And as a financial institution, you know, we have relationships with clearly, to your point, an enormous array of clients from individuals to the world's largest companies. So whether we're providing a HELOC to a family to install solar on their home or underwriting a green bond for a large corporate to build utility scale solar, the product services advice that we provide our clients really have this ripple effect in accelerating progress. I talked earlier about our trillion dollar goal just in 2021 we mobilized approximately 150, 155 billion for climate and environmental transition. So for context, between 2007 and 2020, so that 13 year period under previous goals, we had mobilized around 200 billion, which is a big number and one we're incredibly proud of and frankly, probably one of the largest in the industries, but the juxtaposition of those two numbers sort of speaks to how much focus we and our clients have on making this transition, the acceleration of financing. And we're mm -hmm. financing everything from energy efficiency to renewable energy. We're doing it through lending and capital raising. Um, and we're really proud to have driven some innovative products in the markets like Green Bonds, mm -hmm. which we were the first corporate to issue a benchmark or tax equity finance, where we've been responsible for 16% of solar or wind mm -hmm. here in the US. So hopefully that just gives you a sense of the important contribution that as you put it, one company can make in addressing these critical issues. One company, a big impact, and we're going to have to leave it there. Alex Liftman is Bank of America's Global Environmental Executive. Alex, thank you for joining Axios. Thank you for having me. Now over to Axios Energy Reporter, Ben Geeman. I'm Ben Geeman, Energy Reporter for Axios. Our final guest is Nat Cohan, president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, joining us from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Nat, how are you? Hey, Ben, thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us today. So, yeah, uh, Nat, this is the you know second Earth Day under the Biden administration. And, you know, it's a White House that came in with this historically, I think it's safe to say, ambitious climate agenda. Can you give us the pulse of, of where they are, what they have and what they haven't accomplished? Sure. Um, and, you know, I think it is a good time. Uh, it's a, it's a, the Earth Day. It's the second Earth Day of the administration. And it's also a year on from the president's announcement of the new 2030 target, the nationally determined contribution. So it's a good time to take stock. You know, I think the administration went really fast out of the gate. Uh, last year, the president did so many things on day one, really making clear that climate was going to be a priority for his administration the way it had been a priority for the campaign. They filled all these key top spots in the administration with real climate champions. Um, you had that first 100 day race uh, to the summit that uh, President Biden held where he announced the nationally determined contribution, that 2030 target of cutting emissions 50 to 52% below 2005. I think that was more ambitious than really any of us expected. So that was a really good sign. Coming through the year last year, you had really key steps 
taken on some of the first regulatory approaches on methane from oil and gas on the first car rule. And you were really, you saw the administration building this momentum globally with uh, leading coalitions around methane from oil and gas, around tropical forests, around industry. Um, you had the bipartisan infrastructure framework passed last year that created and put in so much funding for low carbon and clean energy infrastructure. So the, the first year I think was really, uh, was really impressive right out of the gate and they just didn't let up the pace. There is a really important thing remaining to be done, and that is enacting the climate and energy provisions that were in that Build Back Better framework back in the fall. We know that Build Back Better itself is not on the table, but it's going to be so important to get those climate and energy provisions passed. So when I look at the administration's performance, I think, okay, you know, the midterm grade, the middle of these two years, uh, A minus, maybe an A, really impressive off the bat. But that grade is going to remain incomplete if they don't really make a push and work with the Senate to get those key climate and energy provisions passed this year. And that really means in the coming months. And do you sense that that push is truly underway? I mean, it's a White House that's got a lot on its plate. Obviously, we've got the tragedy unfolding uh, in Russia, We have in Ukraine, excuse me, um, with Russia's unprovoked war. We have... Um, you know, inflation, which is related to that, you know, there, there, there's a lot of priorities right now that are perhaps somewhat competing. Do you see that effort to, you know, ensure that this bill, or at least try and give this bill a fighting chance of getting across the finish line? Do you see that coming from the White House right now in a, in a serious way? Well, you know, I think we know that the mode of conversation and the mode of, uh, of negotiation has changed. It was a very public uh, process all through last year. Uh, obviously, the president laying it out, uh, you know, laying out the framework that he wanted to see and then really pushing for it very publicly. Uh, and we saw that that didn't get it across the finish line in the Senate. So I think, you know, there's been lots of reporting by you all and others. And this is what we see, that the conversations are a little quieter this spring. They're still happening, certainly on the Senate side. Um, and what I'm really hoping, and I think is, and I think everybody in the climate community and the NGO community is hoping, is that the administration is putting the same push and the same focus on those climate and energy provisions, getting them passed this year, that they're putting that same push behind the scenes and in the, sort of under the radar as they were publicly last year and throughout the campaign. We certainly know the conversations are happening on the Senate side. Um, I obviously can't say what's being said in those conversations, but I certainly expect and hope that the administration is expressing this as a top priority for this year. And of course, you mentioned, you know, even as these conversations and negotiations have, per have perhaps, you know, been unfolding in a lower profile way and certainly behind closed doors, you know, I'm still thinking of the fact that when you and I spoke last summer for a story I was working on, you made the observation that other nations are also watching the fate of this U.S. legislative effort, right? You know, because the U.S. is obviously trying to get other countries to be more aggressive in their climate efforts, even as the administration's own agenda remains, you know, at this incomplete point that you were just walking us through. Do you see the lack of completed legislation thus far influencing either other nations' actions or the actions of companies, including the companies that uh, that your organization partners with on climate action? So I don't think we're seeing that yet, Ben. I mean, I think uh, you, what you did see last year, as you and I discussed, you saw the positive effect of an administration that came in and made climate a priority. You saw all of that momentum and that progress being made. And that was one reason why the conference COP26 in Glasgow was such an overall success was you had the push from the U.S. But for that to last, it has to be that the U.S. also shows we can match our ambition with actions here at home and with implementation. And there's simply no pathway to meeting that 2030 target that doesn't start with those major climate and energy provisions that were in the Build Back Better framework. The clean energy tax credits are really the workhorse, but also the investment in electric vehicles through an electric vehicle credit, the investment in domestic clean energy manufacturing through 48C. Those are all things that that full package really needs to get across the finish line this year to show that the administration is not only setting really ambitious targets, but is able to make it a priority and push it through Congress to get on track to meet those targets. If the administration does that, I think we will see that continued American leadership. If we can't, 
I think other countries will begin to question whether we're really able to deliver on the promises we've made. Yeah, and, and certainly the next UN climate change conference will be unfolding after the midterm elections, which, which themselves might provide a sense of what, what remains possible or perhaps impossible if, if this legislation has not, has not been finished by then. Um, I wanted to return quickly to something we just touched on briefly earlier. You know, we've got Russia's unprovoked war and this commodity shock that it has been fueling has certainly, I think it's safe to say, altered some of the conversation around um, energy policy. You know, you've got the White House backing at least a near-term increase in oil production um, to help address these prices and the supply crunch, and as well as a big push on expanding natural gas exports to Europe as countries there try and wean themselves from, uh, you know, from Vladimir Putin and Kremlin-backed uh, supplies. You know, the administration is also saying that through all that, they're keeping their eye on the ball of energy transition. Um, and, and moving to a lower carbon future. Are those two things in conflict? Do you see a bit of a paradox there? Well, look, I think, Ben, there are two crises right now that the administration and the world uh, are dealing with, right? Um, one is the immediate crisis of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the other is the long-term crisis of climate change that we continue to see just grow in terms of impact and warnings and, and urgency with every year. And if we didn't know already, the IPCC reports of the last several months have reminded us of that. So I think the way to think about this is really it's all about the time horizons. In the immediate term, I think there are things that can be done and that the administration is doing appropriately, which can help address the dependence that the European, that our European allies have had built up on Russian oil and gas, help them wean themselves off of that oil and gas in the name of supporting uh, the political will needed to push back against Russia's aggression and really help address that geopolitical crisis and help the Ukrainians defend themselves. That I think is possible to do, even though, even while in the long run, still focusing on that long run crisis of climate change. And in the long run, I think those crises are aligned or the solutions are aligned because the way to protect ourselves and uh, from and protect Europe from future aggression of this sort is to is to start to get off of fossil fuels and to accelerate that clean energy tra transition. So in the long run, I think the solutions to those crises are the same. Um, so we just have to make sure that we're not taking steps now that lock in uh, long run emissions in a way that answers the current crisis by undermining the long term crisis. And I, I think we're I think we're seeing some good responses so far from this administration. So I think they see that alignment the same way. Thank you. And as we're as we're starting to run a little bit short on time here, you know, we've both in the last few minutes been discussing some of the real barriers to climate action, but also some of the potential that remains very much there for this administration and more broadly. I guess, you know, given that we're talking about Earth Day, what is the one thought you'd like to leave our viewers with uh, on this Earth Day? Well, so I guess the, the main thought I have is the source of optimism here, right? Um, I've been spending the last couple of days, I'm at a conference in Dallas, I was at a conference in New York the last couple of days, and the overwhelming sense that there is climate tech innovation happening now, that we have the technologies we need and that there are new ones coming in on the horizon to radically uh, reduce carbon emissions, to radically reduce other greenhouse gas emissions while improving people's lives. Um, we have that potential to accelerate the transition to a thriving and resilient and just net zero economy. And that's the opportunity we need to seize. And when you talk to entrepreneurs and innovators, it's right there. Now we need the policies to get put in place that will accelerate that and, and catalyze that change and really accelerate the deployment of those technologies and the development of new ones. That's something I think really there's a role for government policy to put in place. And that's why to come back to where I started, it's so important that we get those climate and energy, energy provisions passed this year. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a, a great and, and thoughtful note to end on. I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. For more information or to sign up for the Axios Generate, AM, or PM newsletters, please visit axios.com backslash newsletters or the Axios app. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you on Axios.com.